Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Moments Orthodox Presbyterian Church. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, just a few announcements for today. Uh, one is that the second offering is for the Benevolent Fund. Also, uh, we will be serving the Lord's Supper this morning. And uh, for anyone who would prefer not to go down the stairs, we do have coffee and tea in the library as well as downstairs. So um, we have options now, which is nice. Also, um, Gems is going to begin this Tuesday, so please keep them in your prayers. And then also, um, we've added Arthur Altmeyer's name to the uh, those with medical needs in the prayer list. Let us now prepare our hearts and minds for the worship of the living God with silent prayer.
Our expository reading for the morning is Deuteronomy chapter 8. The main message of this chapter is that the Israelites were not to forget who gave them the promised land and all the benefits they had both in the Exodus and in the wilderness wanderings. And it was going to be easy for them to forget in prosperity. People tend to remember the Lord God in difficult times when their own resources run out. But if they have lots of their own resources, it can be very difficult to remember that man does not live by bread alone, which comes from this chapter, one of the verses that Jesus quotes during his temptation. In other words, the Word of God is more important to human life in, in many ways than food itself is. And especially when we remember that God's Word, His speaking the Word, is what created all our food to begin with. And so everything we have is dependent, really, on the Word of God. Our very lives are dependent on Him saying, let there be a human. And there was a human. And so to recognize our utter dependence on God, it's not a very American thing to think, but it is a very biblical thing to think. Hear now God's inspired word in Deuteronomy chapter 8. Be careful to follow every command I have given you today so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land that the Lord promised on oath to your forefathers. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert these 40 years to humble you and to test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothes did not wear out, and your feet did not swell during these forty years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. Observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in his ways and revering him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with streams and pools of water, with springs flowing in the valleys and hills, a land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil and honey, a land where bread will not be scarce, and you will lack nothing. A land where the rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I am giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase, and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud, and you will forget the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. He led you through the vast and dreadful desert, that thirsty and waterless land, with its venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water out of hard rock. He gave you manna to eat in the desert, something your fathers had never known, to humble and to test you, so that in the end it might go well with you. You may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth, and so confirms his covenant which he swore to your forefathers as it is today. If you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and worship and bow down to them, I testify against you today that you will surely be destroyed. Like the nations the Lord destroyed before you, so you will be destroyed for not obeying the Lord your God. Please turn with me to hymn number 591, Jesus Calls Us. We'll, stick, we'll sing in response, 591. Thank you. 
our God in prayer. <coughs> o Lord God of heaven and earth, you who have created us by the word of your power, we live, Father, in a fallen world. Fallen because uh, that it is our own fault that we sinned in our first parents, Adam and Eve, that we brought sin and misery to this world. But Father, it did not overturn your plan, but rather established it. And we praise you that your sovereignty is such that you can overturn evil and use, use it for good, that you can bring good out of it, that you can thwart the plans of those who would overturn everything you have planned. We ask, Father, that you would deliver us from every evil work. From the evil of our own hearts, we ask that you would deliver us and show us the way of escape. We ask that you would deliver us from the evil of the world, which would desire to derail our Christian walk. We ask you to deliver us from the temptations of Satan and his demons, so that we would follow your path only. Father, we're thankful that Christ has shown the way that he has resisted temptation to the very uttermost, that he has seen temptation in its very strongest form and overcome it. And so, Father, giving us the Holy Spirit, who is able to keep us from any sin and all sin. But Father, we admit we still fall into temptation. But we ask that you would preserve us from it, and forgive us the sin we have committed for the sake of Jesus Christ. Give us renewed repentance, Father, that we would turn from our sins to the living God. We pray, Father, that our being would be confirmed as blameless in holiness. Lord, we ask that you would protect us when Satan wants to sift us as wheat. We pray that your intercession, O oh Jesus, would prevail at the right hand of the Father. We pray, Father, that you would sanctify us with your truth, because your word is truth. That you would plant your word in us every day so that it may grow and produce fruit, the fruit of holiness and obedience and joy in the Christian walk. We pray, Father, that our circumstances, however difficult they may be, would not control our walk. That you would control our walk. That your Holy Spirit would animate us to the Christian walk. We pray, Father, that your spirit would be abroad as well, that it would, that if there would be revival in the entire world, that your Holy Spirit would start it, and that it would start even here, Father, that the Word of God would go forth in power, and that it would change hearts and minds that it would show the way of salvation, that there is only one way, that it would proclaim the Savior, Jesus, in all of his power, glory, and redemptive power. We pray, Father, for the persecuted church, which pays a heavy price for being faithful. We pray, Father, that you would protect it protect its confession so that it will always see that price as being worth it. We pray that you would hold fast their confession. We pray, Father, that you would strengthen them so that those who persecute may see how futile it is and that they would, in turn, 
receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray for our church and every member of it and, and those we love, Father, that, we, that you would bring us greater maturity in the faith, that you would help us to walk in holiness and be encouragement to one another and be a witness to your good news to those outside our walls. And we pray, Father, for you to use us as your instruments. We pray that those people we know right around us, our neighbors, our family members who don't know you, that you would show yourself to them, your grace, your love, and your mercy, the forgiveness of sins, the promise of resurrection life, and life everlasting. This good news, that it would be on our lips and in our hearts. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I ask that you would turn with me to number 587. We'll stand and sing, Who is on the Lord's side? 587.
be a seated. I invite you to turn in the scriptures to Exodus chapter 4. We'll look at the first 17 verses. Exodus chapter 4, verses 1 through 17. Hear now God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word. Moses answered, What if they do not believe me, or listen to me, and say, The Lord did not appear to you? And the Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, Throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground, and it became a snake, and he ran from it. And the Lord said to him, Reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out and took hold of the snake, and it turned back into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. Then the Lord said, Put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand into his cloak, and when he took it out, it was leprous, like snow. Now put it back into your cloak, he said. So Moses put his hand back into his cloak, and when he took it out, it was restored, like the rest of his flesh. Then the Lord said, If they do not believe you or pay attention to the first miraculous sign, they may believe the second. But if they do not believe these two signs or listen to you, take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. The water you take from the river will become blood on the ground. Moses said to the Lord, O oh Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. The Lord said to him, Who gave man his mouth? Who makes him deaf or mute? Who gives him sight or makes him blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. But Moses said, O Lord, please send someone else to do it. Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses, and he said, What about your brother Aaron the Levite? I know he can speak well. He is already on his way to meet you, and his heart will be glad when he sees you. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you, and it will be as if he were your mouth, and as if you were God to him. But take this staff in your hand, so that you can perform miraculous signs with it. Perhaps the most well-known story of the reluctant prophet is the story of Jonah. The Lord had told Jonah to go to the city of Nineveh, and preached to them that the city was going to be overthrown in 40 days unless they repented. But Jonah hated the Ninevites because of its oppression, oppression of the people of God. And in his mind, the people of Nineveh did not deserve the grace of God. And hence is Jonah's problem, because of course no one can deserve the grace of God. But that's what made Jonah so exceedingly reluctant to go and preach to the people. And there are many possible reasons for reluctance. We are experts at throwing roadblocks up in the way of God's call on our lives, aren't we? For Jonah, it was hatred of the Assyrians. For Moses, it was probably a collection of reasons, doubt in his own ability, Doubt to the promises of God, fear of the Egyptians, fear of his own people's rejecting him as they had already done once earlier, and satisfaction, comfort, and peace in his current position in life. Now Moses had already raised two questions to God. Remember, we're still at the burning bush here, where God has revealed to Moses that he was the great I am. And the two questions that Moses brought up involve the identity of Moses and the identity of God. He wanted to know who he was and he wanted to know who God was. Thus far, Moses is being wise, as John Calvin said in the beginning of his institutes. Almost the entirety of the wisdom we possess 
is constituted by those two questions. Who is God and who are we? God answered Moses that he was the great I am, and he also said, I am going to be with you. So it wasn't so much about Moses, but about who was going to go with Moses. Well, our passage continues this series of questions and answers, but Moses' questions get progressively less wise as they go along. The third question is what Moses asks in verse 1. He asks, what will happen if the people of Israel do not listen to him or believe him? What will happen if they question his vision of God and doubt whether the Lord has really appeared to him? After all, those people aren't right here with Moses, right here, right now. They aren't seeing what Moses seeing, is seeing. They're not seeing this bush burning but not consumed. They don't have this visual picture of God's grace. Moses evidently thinks that getting across to the Israelites is going to be more difficult than talking to Pharaoh. As we know, of course, in the result, the reverse was actually true. The Israelites believed that the Lord was speaking through Moses far, far sooner than Pharaoh ever believed. That. And in one way, though, Moses' question is legitimate because maybe not all Israelites would believe Moses right from the start. But in another sense, the question has just a smackerel of doubt about it, doesn't it? In chapter 3, verse 18, the Lord had already explicitly promised to Moses that the elders would, in fact, listen and agree with Moses. He already told them what was going to happen, even with regard to the Israelites that Moses is having such doubt about. So when Moses asked this question in verse 1, he is, in effect, asking whether or not the Lord might not be wrong in his evaluation of the situation. As one commentator wrote, we're starting to have doubts in our minds at this point as to whether Moses' concerns are really all that genuine, and we're starting to think Moses is simply trying to stall for time, putting roadblocks in the way of God's plan. And that's what makes the Lord's response to this third question so incredibly gracious. God could easily have been angry with Moses by now already. Instead, he gives Moses three signs by which Moses can prove that the Lord did in fact appear to him. The first sign is that of throwing the staff on the ground and it becoming a snake. Why would the Lord give Moses that kind of a sign? Kind of an odd sign, isn't it? Well, there's several things going on here. First of all, Pharaoh wore a headdress that had the symbol of a cobra on it. So by having a staff change into a cobra, or snake and back again, Moses would be proving to the people of God that God was more powerful than Pharaoh. It was a royal symbol. It was Pharaoh's own symbol. Secondly, Pharaoh had many enchanters and sorcerers at his command, and they often spoke of turning a staff into a snake. It was sort of a standard magician's trick. God would therefore be giving the people of Israel proof that the power of God that was with Moses was not in any way inferior to the power that these sorcerers had. In fact, as we will see later on, the power that God gave Moses and Aaron was far superior to the sorcerers of Egypt because the staff Moses threw down would eat up the staffs that the Egyptian magicians turned into snakes. And thirdly, it was a sign of faith. Notice here that God tells Moses to grab the snake by the tail. If you know anything about poisonous snakes, and this was probably a poisonous snake, you'll know the only logical place to grab hold of a snake is right behind its head. It's the only way to control the fangs. By making himself vulnerable, as it were, to the snake, Moses will be proving to the people that believing in God, while seeming to be foolish, is actually the wise thing to do. 
And there is a great lesson for us in that too, of course, because what the world would call foolish is not, in fact, foolish at all. Especially if God tells us it may be the smart thing to do. So Moses does exercise faith here, although there is a somewhat humorous note about how Moses grabbed the tail of the snake. God told Moses to grab the snake by the tail confidently. But the word used here to describe what Moses actually did is not the same word. It's a word that indicates a tentative, quick snatch. You can imagine if you put yourself in Moses' shoes, how nervous you might be being told to grab a snake by its tail and therefore having no power of your own over the snake. You can imagine the relief he felt of having the snake turned back into a staff, and that relief would have been rather enormous. But fourthly and lastly, the fact that Moses grabs the snake by the tail also indicates he's not really the one promised in Genesis 3.15. The promised seed of Genesis 3.15 is the one who would crush the head of the serpent. Moses can only grab the tail. Well, the second sign God gave Moses was the sign of the leprous hand. We don't know exactly what kind of illness of the skin this was, but it was certainly an unclean disease, whether it was leprosy itself, what we call Hansen's disease, or something else. It doesn't really matter that much. What matters is that it was unclean and miraculous. He got this disease on his hand simply by putting his hand inside the breast of his cloak. Then God asks him to make that same motion again. That also would be an act of faith, you understand, because the danger here was not really less than with the snake. Putting diseased flesh right next to regular flesh would be a significant risk of contamination and spread of the disease. And at the, very least, at the very least, the diseased flesh would make the regular flesh ceremonially unclean. But when Moses put his hand back inside the cloak, the hand was restored. The significance of this sign for Israel is that Israel is just as unclean in itself as Moses' hand was. And while someone might say that having close contact with what is diseased would contaminate that. We learned from last time of the burning bush that God's holiness is much more powerfully contagious than our sin is, than our uncleanness. It can hurt to come into contact with what is holy when we are not. We can see that also in Isaiah's case, a burning coal on the lips. That cannot possibly have felt good. But it is cleansing when God's grace is a package deal with that holiness. It reminds me of the story of The Voyage of the Dawn Treader by C.S. Lewis. The boy whose name was Eustace, he was a real pill. The picture of depravity and sin. And while on an island he discovers this dragon's cave that's filled with treasure and filled with thoughts of greed, falls asleep on top of the dragon's hoard and becomes a dragon, turns into a dragon. And the only way to become a regular boy again was by the power of Aslan the lion, who is Lewis's figure of Christ. And Aslan tells him that he needs to take off his dragon scaly skin and Eustace tries to do that but he can't take it off instead Aslan tells Eustace you can't do it I have to do it for you so he digs his claws in very deep and that hurts Eustace horribly but afterwards the skin came off and after bathing in the well he became a new and much improved Eustace you see, it's only by the power of God's healing that we can become who we were meant to be. That's the significance of this sign for Israel. It's nothing less than a picture of salvation itself. 
What happens when the Holy Spirit comes into contact with our unholy soul? Which power is greater? Well, it's the power of the Holy Spirit that's greater. His contagious holiness is more powerful than the, than the power of our sin to taint. But then there's the third sign, turning the water of the Nile into blood. Now, the Greek historian Herodotus once called the land of Egypt the gift of the Nile. So, in the first plague, when God, through Moses, turned the water of the Nile into blood, that meant that the source of the life of Egypt itself became the symbol of death. God is God over life and death, and the Israelites would need to know that, wouldn't they? It's an obvious preview of coming attractions, of course, in that the first plague would turn the entire Nile into blood, and it's also poetic justice, as we'll see more clearly later on as well, because the baby boys were being thrown into the Nile by the Egyptians. And the blood of those boys cries out to God from the water, just as Abel's blood cried out to God from the ground. So these three signs were all given to Moses in order that Moses might have his question answered. You'd think, wouldn't you? But that would be enough for Moses. But it's not. He thinks of himself and he knows, oh, I'm really not that good at public speaking. Some scholars think that what Moses is talking about is an actual speech impediment, and that's quite possible. At any rate, words do not seem to come easily to him. He is not eloquent in his own mind, although, irony of ironies, he seems quite eloquent when trying to get out of doing what God tells him to do. Full of great words there, isn't he? And he probably even thinks that he's being humble here. Oh, I'm just not cut out for this kind of work, God. I just really don't have the gifts for this, God. You think that matters to God when he looks at humanity and sees no one cut out for the job he calls them to do? Is there any human cut out for the job God calls them to do? There isn't. That's because it's about the God who is with us, not about our inherent gifts and graces. You see, Moses could have taken it on faith here that God would give him the right words to say. You'd think these signs would have indicated that to him, but he doesn't do that. And he, he also subtly blames God here. After all, he knows that God is the one responsible for his lack of eloquence. And God hasn't taken away his speech impediment while he was standing right there. Notice God's answer. God is saying all conditions of man are due to God's ordination and creation. But that didn't stop God from calling Moses to this particular task. And he didn't say, oh, I'm going to take away that problem of yours, Moses, right here, right now. Your speech impediment is gone. And he could have done that, of course. Instead, he says, I'm going to get glory by working mighty things through very imperfect instruments. It doesn't matter what your speaking ability is. It wouldn't matter if you couldn't speak a single word, God is saying. God could still use Moses to accomplish his will. So Moses isn't getting out of it that easily, is he? That brings us to Moses' final speech, where we learn what is really in Moses' heart. He simply doesn't want to go back to Israel in Egypt. The literal meaning of verse 13 runs like this. Please send whomever you will send. By the hand of whomever you will send, please send. The unspoken addition being, as long as it isn't me. The 
Lord had already decided to send Moses, had called him to that work, given him all these signs, and Moses was now saying, I don't want to do it. As one commentator puts it, Moses is saying, here am I, send someone else. The very opposite of what Isaiah says. After being touched with the contagious holiness of God, Isaiah says, here am I, send me. Here, of course, the patience of the Lord runs out and his righteous indignation takes over. But Moses is not forcing God into plan B, as some writers tend to think. Moses doesn't get off the hook. God could have simply said at this point, Moses is going to do it no matter what. But even in the midst of his righteous anger, there is still grace here. Because Aaron is already on his way. Who sent Aaron to be already on his way before this conversation even started? God did. God's providence was already moving because he already knew what Moses was going to say. Aaron would be the mouth of Moses, who would in turn be the mouth of God to Pharaoh. Now I'd like us to see a certain contrast and a comparison between Moses and Jesus Christ. Because you see, Jesus Christ also had a certain reluctance to bear on his own shoulders the sin of the world. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he sweated drops of blood. He prayed that the Lord might take this cup away from him. But notice the all-important qualification that makes Jesus different. From Moses. The Lord Jesus prayed also, yet not my will, but your will be done. He submitted to the Father's will even when he saw the full reality of what he was about to face. And that's what Gethsemane meant. He didn't turn back, didn't call upon God to send someone else because there was only one person who could be sent, and that was him. Jesus likewise did many signs to convince us that he was really sent by God and that we should listen to him. As Moses tells us in Deuteronomy 18, God would send another prophet like Moses, and that we should listen to that prophet. Well, that prophet's been sent. God has spoken to us in these last days, in his son, the true prophet. The second thing I'd like us to take away from this is the grace of God in giving us signs. Because we have doubts, don't we? Struggle with doubts, just like Moses did. And it's awfully difficult to believe in a God you can't see, isn't it? It's hard to have faith in a person we cannot see. It's the reason why prayer is so hard. So God gives us signs, too. We have the signs of baptism and the Lord's Supper. They point to the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord of life and death, and that he submitted to death only to conquer it later for the sake of our sins, that there would be atonement for those sins. And it says in the last part of chapter 4, the people believed Moses. So let our reaction also be one of faith. But of course, in our calling, there is often hesitation. Has God really called me to do this? Couldn't he have sent someone else? I feel so inadequate. Well, that's because we are. There's no one who's indispensable to the kingdom of God except the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no one who is adequate for the ministry. There is no one who is adequate for the calling that God has placed on our lives. But has not God promised to be with us? Is it not evident that God is more powerful than our weaknesses? We think we cannot share the gospel because we're not eloquent and we don't have the words to use. Is that an impediment to God who manufactured our mouths in the first place? The problem is not one of lack of gifts. 
The problem is that our faith doesn't always lead to obedience. Let me repeat that. The problem is not that God gave us no gifts or no promises. The problem is that we just don't believe those promises. God calls his entire church to the work of ministry. And Ephesians 4 says this. Why are pastors and teachers and evangelists given to the church? To equip the saints for the work of ministry and of sharing the gospel. This is not something that just the minister does, just the diaconate, just the church session, or all three. It's the work of the church as a whole. And so we trust in our Lord that he will equip us, that he will be with us when it's our turn to say something or to do something that God calls us to do. He's promised that he will be with us. We can believe those promises because God has shown us Jesus who is fully adequate to all of the tasks and he's promised to be with us even to the very end of the age. Now that should be an encouragement to us. The Lord is saying to us right here, right now, it doesn't matter if you were a mute. You could still do the work of the kingdom. He could still use us to share the gospel. He can still use us to carry out the great commission of Matthew 28. So there is no reason left to be reluctant prophets like Jonah or like Moses but to exercise the general prophetic office God has called us to by relying on the grace and the promise of God to be with us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful that you have promised to be with us and that there are no impediments that can prevent you from using us. But Lord, we acknowledge our lack of faith in your promises today. And we ask that you would take away those objections in our minds, that you would take away our fears and our self-doubts, that you would give us a holy boldness and a love for neighbor, that you would help us, Father, by being with us so that we will not fear humanity, but we will only fear you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please turn with me to hymn number 585, Take My Life and Let It Be. Number 585, we'll stand and sing together.
members to come forward this time. We'll be serving the board separate. <coughs> we glad that Jesus' reluctance at Gethsemane did not win, because if it had, there would be no salvation. But he resisted the temptation that was presented to Moses, and to which Moses fell prey. Jesus resisted it to the utter uttermost, and so retained his status as a pure spotless, completely righteous, sacrificial lamb. And so he gives us this sign, the sign of salvation in Christ Jesus, to which the bread and the wine point us. They take us there. They take us to heaven itself by faith and shows us the love of our Savior Jesus Christ his shepherding of our souls, his feeding his sheep. And so he gives us grace when we receive it by faith. The sacrament is for those who are members in good standing of a church that preaches the good news of Christ crucified, dead, and resurrected for the sake of sinners. And that salvation is received by faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ. The sacrament is for those who know their own inadequacies. If we were not inadequate, if we were adequate, we wouldn't need the sign. But this is for those who know that only Jesus is adequate. Only Jesus is sufficient. For those who trust in themselves, or for those who do not acknowledge their own sin, for those who have not repented of their sin. The sacrament is not for those people. They would be eating and drinking judgment on themselves because they would not recognize their utter dependence on the saving work of Christ. But that should not discourage us who know our Dependence and who know our inadequacies and who have repented of our sin from coming to the table because the Lord has promised good. That's why he gives it to us. Just as it's true for the church, it's also true for the supper that we don't come to the church after we've got our act put, up, put all together. We come to the church for God to put us together. And that's what the supper is all about. Salvation in Christ, healing, restoration of fellowship, communion with the Lord Jesus Christ. Hear now, therefore, God's inspired word. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. And then earlier in the passage, Paul says, I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread, and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen. Listen to me and eat what is good, and your soul will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me. Hear me that your soul may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. See, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations you know not, and nations that do not know you will hasten to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. The body of Christ broken for you. Do this in remembrance of him. After supper, Christ took the cup. And when he had given thanks, as has been done in his name, he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink all from it. The grape juice is on the inside, and the wine is on the outside. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush will grow the pine tree, and instead of briars, the myrtle will grow. This will be for the Lord's renown, for an everlasting sign which will not be destroyed. blood of Christ shed for the forgiveness of our sins. Drink all of it. Let us pray. O oh Lord God, you give us signs to strengthen our faith, to give us grace through faith, that we may do what you have called us to do, that you may overcome our reluctance and the obstacles that we like to put in place. Strengthen us, Father, to do the work of your kingdom. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray these things. Amen.
Please stand. It is here now the blessing and benediction of our Lord God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.